So this is the final sermon in our series that we've been doing for the month of July on the parables of Jesus. And Britta started us off at the beginning of the month by helping us understand that Jesus taught in parables using ordinary, everyday, earthly images and situations to help us see a greater truth and to point us to the kingdom of God. And just as new wine can break open an old wineskin, which no longer has the suppleness or flexibility to accommodate the fermentation process of that wine, so too can we become rigid and inflexible, unable to accommodate the new things that God would do in us and through us. God is breaking open the barriers and old routines that are incompatible with transformation, tearing us open to the inbreaking of the divine. I loved that phrase. I actually went back to Britta's sermon video because I wanted to get that phrase right. The inbreaking of the divine. Ah, so good. The next week, Sarah, our pastoral intern, reminded us with the parable of the lost sheep that we are not passive bystanders in God's pursuit of the lost, but that we are called to join God in that pursuit. And then last week, Amy Myhand, our former seminary intern, and her sermon on the parable of the mustard seed pointed us to the relentless, prolific hope that we find in God, which can take root from the smallest of seeds and grow in such scope and scale that it overwhelms the landscape. So this week, the series culminates with the parable of the Good Samaritan, a story that is so familiar to us that the phrase Good Samaritan has transcended religious education and theological thought and become part of our regular vocabulary as a synonym for do-gooder. So friends, let's come now to the Holy Scripture. We'll be reading from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37, and I'm using the Common English Bible. A teacher of the law came up and tried to trap Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to receive eternal life? Jesus answered him, what do the scriptures say? How do you interpret them? And the man answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You are right, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But the teacher of the law wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Jesus answered, there was once a man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when robbers attacked him, stripped him, beat him up, and leaving him for dead. It so happened that a priest was going down that road, but when he saw the man, he walked on by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite also came there, went over and looked at the man, and then walked on by the other side. But a Samaritan who was traveling that way came upon the man, and when he saw him, his heart was filled with pity, and he went over to him, poured oil and wine on his wounds, and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own animal and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Take care of him, he told the innkeeper, and when I come back this way, I will pay you whatever else you spend on him. And Jesus concluded, in your opinion, which one of these threes acted like a neighbor towards the man attacked by the robbers? The teacher of the law answered, the one who was kind to him. And Jesus replied, you go then and do the same. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this parable begins with a question from a bystander. And in this particular case, the questioner is a teacher of the law or a lawyer. And Luke explicitly tells us that he is out to trap Jesus. He starts by asking, teacher, how can I receive eternal life? Now, I suspect at this point, Jesus sort of rolled his eyes and said, dude, you already know the answer to this. 
Go ahead and give it, show off for the rest of the class. So he responds with the summary statement of all Jewish law. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, good job, great job, you've got it. But then the lawyer, and I love in the text it says, the lawyer wanted to justify himself. That is a way of saying, I want to know if you agree with me or if I can trip you up and make you look like a fool. So the lawyer, wanting to justify himself, lays out what is actually the trickier question of the scripture passage, and it's the one that begins, that prompts the parable. And he says, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? It's a good question. When I grew up, uh, I watched a lot of Mr. Rogers. And when Mr. Rogers would say, won't you be my neighbor? I really did want to be his neighbor. You did too, didn't you? I wanted to meet the puppets. I wanted to meet the mailman. I wanted to be Mr. Rogers' neighbor. It makes us feel warm and fuzzy inside. And it really feels like what Mr. Rogers is saying is, won't you be my friend? I love you. Won't you be my neighbor? But what happens when we leave the neighborhood? Do we still encounter neighbors? So I've been thinking a lot in recent months about tribalism. Uh, tribalism is something that we have been hearing about and seeing in newspaper articles and political commentary on the news. People are starting to talk about tribalism in a new way. And the, there's a definition of tribalism, and I'm sharing it with you on the, stream, on the screen. Tribalism is tribal consciousness or group consciousness and loyalty, and is also the exaltation of the tribe above all other groups. So we can see tribalism in just about any aspect of life. We can see tribalism in sports. And I was going to say, um, that's sort of a low level fun tribalism. And then I started thinking about some of the really uh, emphatic sports fans that I know. And I realized, no, this one, I should have put this one at the very end of the list. Uh, and if you ask Lucy about rugby in Scotland, she will tell you that if you're wearing the wrong color scarf on the wrong street, you might die. So um, tribalism in sports, you know, cowboys versus, I don't know, Broncos maybe? I don't know, just saying. Of course, we see tribalism in politics. We've got the red versus the blue. We see it in denominations. We have Presbyterians versus Presbyterian Church of America versus Evangelical Presbyterian Church versus Baptist versus Catholic, whatever. We see it in religions beyond denominations, Christianity versus Islam. We see it in geographic delineations, North versus South. And we see it in every possible version of race, culture, or creed. Now, I have always assumed that tribalism was something that was hardwired into our biology. That it was something that was part of our self-preservation instinct that helped keep us alive over the course of evolution. It was part of what helps us distinguish between what is safe and what is dangerous, who is a friend, who is a foe. It turns out that that isn't actually true. Anthropologists believe that the earliest humans on the planet who were hunter-gatherers did not treat each other with suspicion. And in fact, members of groups could come and go with other groups with ease and with acceptance. Anthropological evidence also suggests that there was very little violence between human groups and that there was no war. As human beings started to uh, put down roots, as they started to invest time and energy in animals and agriculture and in buildings, the desire to protect what is ours began to take root and anthropologists began to see a slow but steady shift 
from a cooperative human existence to a perception of competing groups. Tribalism emerges when we are afraid. When we are afraid that you will hurt me, when we are afraid that you will take what is mine, when we are afraid that there isn't enough to go around. You know, an interesting thing about fear is that in our brains, fear bypasses the logic center. Uh, I mean, in terms of evolution, I think that is because when you are in a dangerous situation, the brain goes straight to fight or flight and doesn't have time to sort of think through consequences. If you're about to get mauled by a bear, uh, your brain doesn't want to spend time thinking about uh, hibernation schedules or migration patterns or uh, a bear's diet in this particular region of the country. It goes straight to fight or flight. So if fear is the basis of tribalism, tribalism is inherently irrational. So this lawyer asks Jesus, who is my neighbor? Another way of phrasing that is who am I obligated to love based on Jewish law? It is actually a very tribalistic question. Who's in my tribe? Who belongs and who doesn't? Who is in and who is out? Who has rights or standing or power but must be respected? And who can be dismissed and disregarded? Now we all get it, and you've heard it in every single sermon you've ever heard preached on the Good Samaritan. The Samaritan represented to the Jewish audience who was listening to Jesus everything that is unneighborly about their imaginations. It is not like we have to think through or wonder. This is not one of Jesus' more perplexing uh, parables, right? The moral is very clear. It, we don't have to guess what is Jesus getting at. It's not, it's not multi-layered and complex in the same way that some of Jesus' other parables are. But in that way that Jesus has of flipping things upside down, he takes the question that the lawyer asks, who is my neighbor? And at the end of the parable, he turns it completely upside down. As he finishes the story, he asks the lawyer, who acted like a neighbor? Who acted like a neighbor? With this question, Jesus, he's completely shifting this mandate to love neighbor from tribal obligation to a choice and an action that is beyond tribe. It doesn't matter who you perceive your neighbor to be, we are called to act like a neighbor to everyone. So what does that look like? What does that look like in the here and now? Well, of course, all of my best stories come from my husband Rob's congregation in San Antonio. Rob is a Presbyterian pastor on the west side of San Antonio. He has been a pastor of Divine Redeemer Presbyterian Church for almost 30 years now. And the west side of San Antonio inhabits the poorest zip code in the entire San Antonio metropolitan area and uh, is number one, it's the number one zip code in the country for teen, multiple teen pregnancies. So a teenage mom having more than one child before she is out of their, her teens. So this is a neighborhood that um, has a lot of diversity. Um, the neighborhood, uh, the church is actually quite old, it's 100 years old, and there are numerous members of the congregation who are fourth generation members of this church. They grew up going to kindergarten on the church grounds. They, uh, their, their lives are sort of intricately and intimately wrapped up in this group of people and in this particular space. So one of the things that has been um, well, it just is. During, during the pandemic, when things weren't happening in the church with the incredible regularity that normally they do, that, that church building is used 24-7. It is used every day of the week for a myriad of things. And during the pandemic, things were shut down to a very unusual level, just like they were every place else. 
And so uh, some of the folks in the neighborhood who are experiencing homelessness, and there are quite a few, uh, some of them started really hanging out on the church property. Um, Unfortunately, that meant things like using the church lawn as a bathroom or taking a full shower from the church hose. And so one woman in particular, her name is Isabel, has been hanging out at the church with a lot more frequency and regularity since the church has been closed down. So Rob had met her a number of times uh, as he was going to work. Uh, her name was Isabel. And so they had had some interesting conversations, uh, like many folks who are living on the streets. Um, Isabel is probably an addict and probably experiencing some mental illness. Um, but she and Rob had several conversations. And at the beginning of June, just like us, they started regathering for in-person worship. And people were very, very excited about this. And people were really looking forward to being together. So. A few weeks towards the end of June, um, uh, Divine Redeemer this summer has a seminary intern, which many of us met when we did our, our mission experience, our family mission trip that is in partnership with Divine Redeemer in San Antonio, working on homes in that neighborhood. And so their seminary intern, James Martin, was preaching on this Sunday. And he was preaching on the text of the Good Samaritan. And so Isabel had been hanging out on the front lawn all morning long, and between the services, they have a Spanish language service, and then a break, and then a bilingual service. And during the break, they often do some sort of breakfast together. And they had made breakfast tacos. Somebody had seen Isabel on the front lawn, went and offered her a taco. She accepted and decided to join them for worship. Congregation was very receptive to this. This was not even a particularly unusual thing to have happen. And she came in and ended up sitting about three rows from the front, right in front of the pulpit. They do a time of prayers of the people, similar to what we do together, but at Divine Redeemer, congregants I know you've seen this done, you've probably participated in it. Congregants raise their hand and the microphone is sort of passed around and people share their joys and their concerns and things they would like the community to pray for them about. So Isabel joined in to this activity and uh, the congregation was very supportive even when she got incredibly long-winded and started telling stories about angels who live on her shoulders the congregation was very was nonplussed and just kept on going and uh, there were no uh, snickers there was no uh, outrage under their breath they were continued to be supportive and kind so James gets up to preach. This is the first time James has ever preached in front of a congregation before. And he's standing at the pulpit, and he is preaching, and Rob said he was getting fiery. And Rob is sitting, their church is, uh, we don't do this, thank goodness. Um, worship leaders sit in, in chairs behind, uh, that's the worst. We're never doing that, y'all. <laughs> So, but at Rob's church, they do that. And so, oh, and the other thing you need to know about this church, it is a matriarchy. Rob might think that he's in charge. No, he is not in charge. This church is a matriarchy, and it is a matriarchy that is generations in the making. And the, the women of, of Divine Redeemer, if you do something wrong, they are not at all shy about standing up and coming over to you and giving you a little correction, okay? It is the kind of congregation where people will shout things out and will, will either in the affirmative or in the negative. There's, it's a very participatory place. Bill Brock, you would fit in very well there. Okay, so James is preaching earnestly, intensely, passionately about the Good Samaritan. And for some undetermined reason that nobody knows, Isabel stripped naked to the waist. For some reason undetermined, 
Isabel stripped naked to the waist. So, go ahead and laugh, it's okay, it's funny. <laughs> so Rob said, he was sitting in a chair that was somewhat blocked by the pulpit, and he said, there was the strangest thing. It sort of felt like all the air sucked out of the room. So I, I leaned my head this way, and Isabel was naked to the waist. Now, what you would have expected would it be a sharp intake of breath, perhaps judgmental murmuring under your, behind your hand. None of that happened. Congregation didn't move. Nobody reacted, nobody pointed, nobody did anything. And a woman who's grown up in that church who is a geriatric psychiatrist got up and sat behind her and talked to her softly and gently until her, her discomfort and her irritation, whatever was bothering her, subsided. She didn't put her clothes back on. And God bless James, he didn't miss a beat. He kept right on preaching. He didn't miss a word. And he was only like halfway done. <laughs> So, Livy, the, the psychiatrist, alerted a guy who had just retired as a policeman and said, let's go ahead and call 911. She seems to be in some distress and she's got a, a wound on her leg that I think needs some attention. Let's go ahead and call EMS. So, EMS arrived. Uh, they waited outside, the service concluded, the acolytes, who are children, walked up the center aisle, snuffed out the candles, walked back the center aisle, didn't blink, didn't flinch, didn't do a thing. At the end of the service, when they finally got Isabel to put her shirt back on, got her engaged with the medical personnel to see about her leg, Two of the oldest and most powerful matriarchs of the congregation came up to Rob. And Rob thought, okay, what's, what's this gonna be? They said, Rob, it was hot in here. We wanted to take off our shirts too. <laughs> Rob said, I have never been so proud of my congregation in 30 years. And I think what this story gives us is some really clear steps, some really clear ideas about what it looks like in that tangible, practical way to act like a neighbor. So the first one is this. We are all children of God. And when we can recognize and affirm that, we are able to let go of so much of the judgment and the disdain and the prejudice that we tend to carry around with us. That congregation was able to see Isabel as a person, as a child of God, not just as a homeless, mentally ill addict. The second one, is what, you know, Jesus says over and over again, he says, follow me. He doesn't say, worship me. He doesn't say, get on your knees and worship me. He says, follow me, do what I do. And what does Jesus do? He constantly, consistently, regularly reaches out with love and compassion and grace to everybody, particularly those who have been excluded from the tribe. Friends, relationship is the antidote to division. It is only in our ability to connect to the humanity of one another that we have the strength and the motivation to act like a neighbor. The third one is to align ourselves in solidarity with the least of these. And that can look like a whole bunch of different things. And what those two matriarchs of Divine Redeemer were doing when they came up to Rob and said, it was hot in here, we wanted to take off our shirts too, is they were aligning themselves in solidarity with Isabel. 
They were aligning themselves in solidarity, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to do the same thing, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have opinions about the right thing and the wrong thing to do, but we can still align ourselves in solidarity with those who are struggling, who are on the fringe, who are not part of the tribe. When we when we do this, when we do this, we are actually thumbing our nose at tribalism. We are defying tribalism when we do this. When we lend our, our allyship and solidarity to others, we are defying tribalism and we affirm that we are one tribe, one family, one neighborhood, and we blur and dissolve the lines that would divide us. We expose the lie that there is not enough to go around. Because friends, that is a lie. Particularly when we are talking about the grace of God, that we have the tendency to want to hold tight and make just for us. When God became flesh and went to the cross for every single one of us, every single one of us, no qualifications, no, nothing, every single one of us. And finally, we don't have to agree with each other in order to act like a neighbor. So there's a Mennonite church in San Antonio, and if you know anything about Mennonites, uh, they tend to be very, uh, very communally engaged and very interested in issues around social justice. And the Mennonite Church in San Antonio for many years has had a mission house. Uh, it's a large uh, home in a neighborhood that is right behind the Mennonite Church, and they have used it to house uh, mission groups from churches, from f any, any sort of, of configuration of mission groups. But some years ago, when the crisis at our border uh, became intensified, uh, they, they shifted the use of that property to be a sort of a stopping spot for those who were released from border detention, who were then trying to get bus tickets and get to family members and do all of those things. And there was this one moment a few years ago when they released hundreds of people at the same time. And so all of the facilities around San Antonio, which were housing and helping this population, were completely inundated. So that day, the Mennonite Church had received something like 400 people in one day, which they had no capacity to manage, really. And so um, the pastor, John, appeared on the five o'clock news and, and basically put a call out. He said, uh, we need food, we need uh, bedding, we need uh, clothing, we need backpacks, we need all kinds of things. So anybody who can help, uh, you know, this is where we are. Well, a few hours later, about seven o'clock that evening, a truck drives into the parking lot, and it's a pickup truck, and at the back of the pickup truck is an American flag and a Confederate flag. And all across the bumper were all kinds of bumper stickers that make you cringe. And out of the truck gets this big guy with a cowboy hat. And the people at the church were afraid. And so the pastor, John, went out to meet him. And the guy says to the pastor, is this the place where all those illegals are? And John said, yes, it is. And he said, well, I've got a truckload of food and clothes. Thought maybe you guys could use it. We don't have to agree to act like a neighbor. What question are you asking yourselves? And what question are we asking as a community? Are we asking who is my neighbor? And if we are, is that to the end of figuring out who is in and who is out? Or are we asking ourselves, how can I and how can we act like a neighbor in this time and in this place? 
Alleluia. Amen. Let's pray. Holy and gracious God, you do call us to more than we are. You call us every minute of every day. Open our ears and our hearts that we may hear. As we go forward, remind us what neighborliness looks like. Help us reach out with your love, your grace, and your compassion to all that we meet. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.